Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, ocean and uh, marine uh, gravity station. Um, we will have uh, so this is the first part of the of the session, and uh, we will have uh, five uh, talks in this uh, in this uh, first part. Um, the first one uh, will be a keynote given by uh, Oli Anderson. Um, on ocean and uh, marine gravity from uh, CreateSet. So uh, I just remind you that you can ask questions in the chat um, and uh, we will uh, uh, read the questions uh, after the after the talks. Um, Bole, if you are ready, you can share your slides. Thank you. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, it's fine. Well, it's really a privilege for me to, to give this presentation. It's been a fantastic journey the last uh, 10 years, um, improving gravity field from uh, from cryosat to two. Um, and it's also fantastic because uh, ocean marine gravity was never one of the scientific objectives of cryosat. It was actually sort of a, a byproduct or a by thing that, that came out of, of the cryosat mission. Um, so what I would like to do today is to give you the status after 10 plus years uh, since the launch of, of Cryosat. Um, I'd also like to, to acknowledge my, my co-authors Adil Abulaiti Chang, Stina Rose, Pierre Knudsen, and particularly David Sandwell from Scripps Institute of Oceanography and Walter Smith from, from NOAA, who also um, did a lot of, 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 of this improvement over the last uh, decade. Um, just a moment. Um, just trying to shift this uh, piece down. Yeah, here we go. So what I will go through, uh, I will run through the basic the basics at a glance, and then I will in introduce this uh, revolution within the, the second generations of satellites, which was was primed by by Cryosat. Um, I'll talk about how has the the global uh, gravity field improved over the last decade. What have we done to improve? It's, it's, it's a lot to do with spatial filtering and retracking, double retracking to get as good range precision as possible. And then I will look into the specific uh, importance and the specific value where we got from Browsat. It's in the coastal regions, it's in the Arctic regions or the high, high latitude regions, and, and, and it's also particularly in the, in, into bathymetry and, and, and geophysical exploration. And then I will end up uh, with a bit about what's next. So if you look at the gravity field, this is the gravity field of the Earth. This is actually any gravity field of the Earth. This could be the, 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 fel, the, the field from Scripps, from Sandwell and Smith. It could be our gravity field. It could be EGM 2008. You cannot see the difference on the global scales. All the development in gravity field models is actually in the small uh, uh, scales. If you want to resolve each of these small anomalies uh, that you see here in, in this plot to higher and higher accuracy, because this is where the information about what is underneath the surface lies. So it's really about gradual and small uh, improvement or larger improvements of each of these uh, uh, red and blue dots uh, in the map um, that we are working on when we do this from altimetry. So what it's all about is actually that we want to, to um, uh, map the sea surface or the sea surface height or sea surface slope as accurate as possible. Um, if you have an, here you have a, an illustrations of an ocean floor with a sea mount, you can see that the, 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 there is some sea mount here. And, and this causes the sea surface in a permanent way always to have a little bump on it. It can be like, five, 10, 50 centimeters, depending on, on the size of, of the underneath a mountain. Um, so what we want to do is that we want to resolve this uh, a change in height or sl slope across the, um, across the, um, the, the, the undersea structure. And the key parameter here is actually the range precision. So the more precise that we can do the height or the slope, the more precise we can derive gravity. 
it actually doesn't matter if the surface is here or, or higher or lower, what, what the accuracy is, it is about the range precision. And when I talk about range precision, it's actually quite phenomenal because if we want to predict something with two milligal uh, uh, accuracy in the gravity field, it corresponds to retrieving the sea surface height or the difference uh, uh, with, with two centimeters height precisions over seven kilometers. So it's pretty phenomenal. If you want to do one milligal, it's it's one centimeters height precision that we are that we are chasing here. This has been a long journey, 25 years, where we really uh, improved the methods uh, over and over again, uh, and getting all this uh, informations better and better. Uh, takes a little slow in shifting here. Okay, yeah. Um, so, so, so we have we have set up uh, a different institution, uh, Scripps and, and and DTU has set that sort of gravity prediction engines, um, and and where we are trying to get this height as 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 and, and the height variations as 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 accurate as possible, and to turn uh, these height variations, which is called the GR variations, into gravity, we need the radial uh, derivatives of this. Fortunately. Uh, we can use the Laplace equation, which says that the radial derivatives uh, can be found from the sum of the horizontal derivatives. Uh, and this is why there are two methods to do this, either to use the height mapping over structures or sea surface slopes. And we all do it by taking out the long wavelength from a model, could be EGM, and then all, all, only look at the small scales to, 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 to make them better and better. And when that is done, we then restore, we will then restore uh, the global gravity field. It could be EGM 2008. And and this points a little point here is that okay, we take something out and put it back again. So if, and, and this is also important to 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 the way we do it. So, um, in total, um. Since the, the beginning of the satellite era, there's actually been six geodesic missions. And by geodesic missions, I mean a mission with a, with a one more than one year repeat or 10 kilometer ground track stations. It was paved with Geosat in the 80s and Eris 1 in the 90s. But then there was 15 years of drought. Nothing happens. From these two uh, missions, we only had one year from each of the missions, uh, uh, gravity observations. A lot of work was done to get gravity from that one. But it wasn't until uh, the change with, with the loss of Cryosat in 2010, then they also found out, okay, we can also put Jason uh, um, a, as a part of this in, uh, end of life mission uh, into a geodetic mission. And also they put now uh, Jason 2 um, uh, when it's getting close to the end of, of, of the, its life and several LCCAM. So a lot of, we actually had four new uh, geodetic missions since 2010. It's resulted in a tenfold amount of data, which is actually quite phenomenal. Um, so things have really changed a lot. Um, yeah, and this is just uh, um, a, a plot of, of these, uh, um, of, of how dense the tracks are that we are really looking for. Uh, this is just a, a, a small square uh, outside uh, uh, Bahamas. Um, a few degrees by a few degrees, uh, but you can really see how 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 the different missions have different inclinations. Uh, the Jasons have lower inclinations, and the the the, the cross up down here has has higher inclination. But you can also see that they are different. Uh, some of them are, are more stable than others. But you can also see that particularly the, the Sarah uh, uh, mission has what is called a non-repeating orbit. Uh, this means that it, it they cannot control the orbit anymore, so it just drifts. And 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 um, so it sometimes it has very big holes between the tracks, uh, but it of course becomes better and better with time. Yeah. Uh, so how should we use all these ten years or ten repeats of 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 of, of cryosat? Uh, in principle, we could actually just average the repeat because this would average the the the, the temporal variation, but it's actually not very good because. The track maintenance is not very, very precise for cryosat, and you can see that the the the, the difference between uh, a, a cycle one and cycle two, the same uh, a track, it varies from from cycle to cycle, 
and the standard deviation is actually uh, 0.6 kilometers, which is 600 meters. So the very so it's actually better to take each of the repeats uh, of these 10 repeats of 10 years of data that we have from Crossat and just put it into to the whole uh, gravity engine uh, because we get better and better spatial coverage, which is important for for gravity. Um, yeah. Yeah. And and what what Kraus had uh, 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 promised this is a, a very old plot by by by, by Keith Rainey was really uh, uh, the phenomenal thing was this as I said before uh, the range precision it was a twofold uh, improvement in the height range precision by the use of the delayed Doppler and particularly for the for the SAR altimetry it was what is promised as one is and and also what it has been delivered and this is really what has turned our gravity field predictions into a new level. Um, so, but there are other ways to improve the, 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 the range precision. And one of the things that, that uh, Sandwell and, and, and colleagues came up with is that you actually do a two-step uh, uh, retracking of the data. First, you do a three-parameter retracking of the data compared to a normal retracking. Um, and here you can actually see that uh, um, you can see that the newer satellites from from Jason had around uh, uh, um, seven centimeters of, of of range precision. You can see the newer ones becomes better and better down there with the Seral uh, LTK uh, uh, at the best and the lower end. This is from the three normal three parameter uh, uh, retracking. But then when you if you fix and 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 say that the significant wave heights should only vary smoothly along the track. Then you uh, um, fix some of the here in inherent ambiguity in, in the solution, and you can actually make the height precision even better. Um, hello? Oh, shit. Yeah, here. This is what this is showing. So when you do this, 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 this double retracking, you actually improve the range precision by nearly a factor of of 50% or a factor of 1.5. Uh, and you can actually see that from the first generation to the second generation, uh, uh, with the second generation, we are at, at, at four centimeters in generally. You can also see that that the, the LRM, which is the, 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 the low resolution data, are from Crossat are also improved by, by this, this factor 1.5. But the SAR and SARIN data are not improved. They're already very accurate, as, as Chris Rainey also pointed out before. But you can see in the bottom here that Seral is actually, or LCK is actually surpassing them all when it comes to, to, to range precision because of its higher uh, point, uh, a pulse repetition frequency and its uh, smaller footprint from the use of the KA band uh, uh, altimeter. Um, you can also see this um, here. You can see uh, this is the median aberrant sea surface slope. Uh, this is a uh, plot from 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 Shang et al. Um, you can see the from from Cryosat, um, but you can see when you when you when you take Seral in, it's a bit better. Then, isn't Seral then more important to gravity field uh, uh, than Cryosat? Yes and no. But just a moment, can I get this to shift? Oh, shit. <laughs> Here we go. It shifts very slowly. Yeah, so this just says that, that it is more, but but the, the, the clear importance of Cryosat is of its, um, that it's, that, 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 that the tracks are equally spaced uh, uh, throughout the globe. This is the importance of, of, of Cryosat compared to LTK. Um, so before uh, uh, um, before the launch of Cryosat, uh, this is a typically gravity field from one of the older 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 plots. You can see that the gravity field is is slightly noisy. This is the vertical gravity gradient. After Cryosat um, came in, this becomes more and more or less and less noisy. Uh, you can maybe you can see that the next slide. If I get this to shift properly. Oops, sorry. I have a little problem with this. 
here. Yeah. Then you can actually see that the 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 noise in the gravity field becomes less and less. And this is actually what we are after, because we're after all these small scale structures. So we have to get these aligned, these are sort of tectonical structures underneath the sediments, which we can get aligned because this, the, 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 the noise in the gravity field becomes less and less uh, with cryosat and, and the other altimeters. And this is very important to, to a thing like uh, exploration geophysics. This is an example uh, offshore uh, uh, Brazil in the Santos Basin. You can see in the center of the of the picture there are actually two operating uh, oil oil fields uh, 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 of the big uh, Brazilian. But if we take a, a DTU fifteen uh, a gravity field, it actually reveals that there are a number of other lows, which is actually where you get the chalk the chalk structures, which is the ones that traps the oil. So you can really see that there's a number of other potential uh, oil fields in this. So there's a huge potential to to this. Uh, uh, um, for 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 example, like uh, 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 oil prediction, um, and 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 to to sell or to show you how it's been improving over the years, uh, uh, this is just an example um, where we've used some very high uh, 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 accurate uh, data from 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 NGA. Uh, they have an accuracy of around two milligil, and you can see since two thousand and ten. Uh, the pre cryosat 2, it's improved from 3 milligal with this data or 3.3 milligals to 2.45 milligals. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually uh, uh, quite a lot. It, it indicates that the, that the error on the altimetric gravity field, like on a global scale, is today around 2 milligal. Um, and this is actually quite phenomenal because when we started out 10 or 20 years ago, we were talking four or five milligals. So we can really see a lot of structures and a lot of potential in this in this field that we couldn't do before. So what are the specific uh, uh, regions where, where cryosat has, 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 has really been significant to this? One of the things is the coastal regions and, and another thing is, is, is the Arctic regions. Uh, and let me just highlight this to you here. Um, particularly in the coastal regions, a lot of our focus has been on improving the shorter scales. And when we do the gravity field, we don't use conventional one hertz uh, uh, altimeter. We use the 20 hertz because we, can, we need to get the scales down to 10 kilometers. And we don't use uh, a normally, we don't use a normal a box filter uh, uh, to get two hertz or, or one hertz data. Um, uh, since uh, the, uh, we use an, another filter this could be like the Parks McClellan, McClellan filter, uh, which was devised by, by Sandwell uh, um, uh, earlier. And the advantages of this is that with a box filter would actually alias uh, a part of the signals into the long wavelength, or the long wavelength being the 20 to the 50 kilometer signals. When you use such a signals, you preserve the wavelengths better. And this enables us to resolve finer and finer scales in the gravity field. And today we are we resolve the gravity field all the way down to around 15 kilometers, uh, um, which is quite phenomenal. If you think about the gravity missions, we are talking hundreds of kilometers. So also, also, satellite altimetry is the only way to get to these tens of, of kilometers. Um, and in the coastal region, yes, um, you can really see how they improved since a field I just took KMS 2 was a field from 2002. You can see this was pre cryosat and this is now. So we've got DTU 21. Uh, it, it compares uh, at, at these various regions. This is sort of colored by depth, um, but you can really see that that very close to the coast, the improvements in gravity field predictions is 60%. Um, and it's, it's really, really, really uh, improved a lot uh, from four to five milligals before cryosat and now with it with cryosat and the other satellites we are down to around this two milligal so it's really phenomenal uh, uh, improvement globally or in coastal regions um yeah and 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 actually in a lot of of cases uh, we see comparisons even below the uh, uh, two milligal and this sort of indicates that that, that maybe the the the, the altimetric gravity field is even better 
because uh, when you do the comparison with the marine gravity field, there's also errors in the marine observations. This is a comparison with very high uh, uh, accurate marine observations from, from SHUM. Um, you can see that the, the comparisons uh, to this survey, just a moment, if it will shift here. Uh, come. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, here you can see around 1.4, 1.5 milligal in this year. And in, in another plot here is from, um, from the Gulf of Mexico. It should be there in a second. Yes, it is from, from David Sandwell. With his newest gravity field, when you compare to all of this, uh, this is some EDCON data, we are around to, to one, between one and one and a half milligal. So it's really phenomenal what, what is going on here. So, and also in the Arctic region, uh, um, we have really been able to, 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 to improve the, the gravity field uh, uh, phenomenally, and particularly north of 82 with this arrow here, is, you can see for the first time we get a lot of information uh, uh, for, for our sea surface height observations uh, for doing gravity field prediction. But it's not trivial to do it in the Arctic because of sea ice. So we have taken a lot of time and a huge effort to do tailored retracking uh, in order to get the sea surface heights observations everywhere inside the leads of the ice to do gravity field improvements over the last decade. Uh, and also we get information uh, which is really phenomenal across that all the way into the coast. You can really see like these coastal regions, you can get all the observations all the way into the coast and, and really up in fjords and everywhere you get the very nice um, very nice uh, 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 observations which can be used for gravity field prediction. I need to sh this to shift again. Yes. So um, this is a comparison with marine gravity north of Greenland. Um, it was a huge uh, airborne survey done in 2009. And this really shows uh, the importance of, of, of cryosat uh, in this region north of, of 82. If I can get it to shift. Oops. Yeah. Um, you can see pre cryosat, uh, uh, the error was around 10 milligal compared to this. Uh, then we started improving it with DGU 15, 5, around 5, 6, mil, 4, and we are down to around 3.9 milligal now. So it's a really, or a nearly a three fold improvement in the gravity field uh, in, in the Arctic regions. Another way to, to, to demonstrate this is that uh, if you compare the best collection. Um, of, of, of data holdings from ships um, with a GOCO model. Um, I will hope it comes up here. Um, we have a, a, a standard deviations to degree and order uh, uh, 200 of, of, of one milligal. Uh, but if we do altimetry uh, in the Arctic, we get down to 0.7 a milligal to degree in order 200. So it's a phenomenal improvement that we've seen in the Arctic Oceans. I will just shift. Um, yeah. So just before I end, I've just got two more slides on bathymetry because when we do and, and, and get the gravity field much better, we can also do bathymetry much better. And so there are one minute left. Yes. Um, and there is a um, easy way to do it um, because there is a, um, well, I would like to skip this um, and go to my conclusions because I cannot move the, 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 the gravity field. Um, yes, this was a bit of a, of a bummer. Um, because it's very important to uh, uh, in, improve the, 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 the bathymetry. But, but overall, it's been quite phenomenal in the journey. Um, with a, a, a cryosat, um, we have been able to, just a moment, we've been able to, to improve the short wavelength, but there's still a long way to go. Uh, I'll just end with this slide. Uh, it's been a huge uh, leap forward, and we've improved a lot of uh, 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 region, particularly polar and coastal regions, and we're around two milligal now. Um, but there'll be new satellites coming, um, and we still need to improve uh, 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 and systematically densify the tracks. Uh, and this is where cryo to ice could be very important, but also perhaps considering an interleaved uh, missions 
at the later stage of, of, of the cryo submission. Um, yes, thank you for listening and, and, and sorry for the uh, problems I have with the, with the slides. Thank you. Thank you. I think that we have uh, a question from uh, Jerome in the chat that is asking if there is any added value of Sarin for retrieving small-scale small seafloor variations as an example near to the coast or with very high topographic gradients. Uh, in, 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 indeed there is, and, um, but, but it's, again, we, we need just a range precision. Uh, when we do this, uh, and this is sort of once uh, 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 sometimes this this gives a preference to SARDATE instead of SARIN, um, but we get generally more SARIN data very close to the coast, which is of the same importance to 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 to. So it's both the range precision and the, uh, a number of data that is important to to resolve the the small gradients. Yeah. Okay, then uh, there is another uh, question from uh, Christopher. Maybe you can uh, answer uh, offline because we have to pass to the next uh, speaker, which is uh, okay. uh, which is uh, uh, Pablo Garcia from uh, uh, from Mitzelsat, uh, that is uh, uh, participated to various uh, project uh, in the. Uh, in the application of, of Ocarisa data, especially in, in the coastal altimetry. And uh, this is also the topic of this uh, talk, which is Ocarisa 2 coastal altimetry. And uh, okay, Paolo, floor is yours. Okay, can you listen to me? Yes. Yep. Okay, thank you, Michele. Um, happy to show you this uh, presentation of our uh, results of uh, now uh, six years of uh, data that we could uh, gather from cry submissions. Uh, we are a team here for this coastal processing uh, algorithms. Alba Granados is uh, in charge of the retracking operations, and we have uh, Monica Roca and Abel Al Albert Garcia, Ferran Giver, uh, Dorca Moyano, Adrian Flores. Uh, also contributing with discussions and, and patterns. And also I have to acknowledge the work that uh, at the beginning of this uh, uh, project uh, did uh, Christina Martin Puch when she was at the South Sad, adapting the, the Samos uh, model for the retracker. And also Eduard Macul that uh, did that work uh, adapting uh, these uh, algorithms to other missions like Sentinel-3 or Sentinel-6. Let me see if I can, okay. So um, we will give a little bit of background uh, the, the initial project. Uh, we then will explain uh, the two approaches that we have uh, developed. Then some results uh, around Cuba and the, Med, uh, the Med Mediterranean Sea. And finally, uh, one slide of uh, conclusions. So this started uh, years ago, like, uh, uh, seven years ago or eight uh, with this uh, Chrysler Plus for Ocean project uh, under the Support to Science Element program from ESA. Uh, what we did here was to try to find a solution to get rid of the contamination uh, that we have uh, uh, usually uh, when we approach to, to the coast, uh, not only for uh, contamination from land, but also from uh, shallow waters, specular waters uh, along the coast. Uh, you can check in this uh, technical note uh, the details. And also we have published uh, a paper two years ago. Uh, you have here the reference also, with, uh, together with Christine, Martin Butch and Monica. So uh, what we have uh, is a problem that we try to solve is uh, that uh, when we approach the, to the coast, we have uh, the, included in the power waveform energy from a lot of uh, possible surfaces. Uh, usually, uh, we uh, expect uh, to have interferences from land, but uh, calm waters are mainly the one that uh, disturb the, the, the information uh, that we could have. And we have uh, really specular calm waters acting like a mirror uh, with a high backscatter and 
and uh, forcing the retracting to to go to that uh, kind of uh, very high peaks uh, of power. Um, so we we aim the aim is uh, to select here uh, uh, a section of the waveform. So it's a sub waveform approach. We select the section of the waveform with the ocean navy ocean information. Uh, usually we have uh, these calm water uh, reflections uh, in the trailing edge, so we can get rid of them. But uh, sometimes uh, there's a the coincidence in range of uh, some uh, flat surfaces from land uh, with higher elevation, but not nadir. Uh, and if they uh, if if they go into the leading edge, so we we cannot solve this uh, kind of problem with this approach. Uh, so th this is a, a, a real uh, coastal waveform from the Cryosat in setting data. I think uh, this is uh, around Cuba. Uh, and as I said, uh, this uh, in, in the blue zone, you will have the, the typical ocean signal from uh, setting data. And then we have uh, this kind of interferences uh, in the red uh, zone here in the trailing edge. So, uh, as a first approach uh, in this CP4O project, we, uh, we, we worked with setting data. We worked with the three waveforms, uh, the coherence uh, waveform, the angle of arrival waveform from the phase difference, uh, the difference of the phase of uh, the two antennas, uh, and uh, finally, the power, power waveform. What we did uh, was first to, to select, uh, you have here the, the threshold, uh, the 800, uh, it, uh, we select uh, all the samples that uh, were over that threshold, so with uh, good coherence, high coherence. Then uh, from those uh, which are uh, highlighted here in red, uh, we selected the one with the lower angle of arrival, which means uh, that uh, this information is coming from uh, close to Nadir. And then uh, with that uh, double selection, we have a, a section of the waveform that we can uh, retract and not including all the, the rest. So we, we take a reference and we select the number of samples here uh, approaching to a song where, where there is only thermal noise and a little bit of uh, trailing edge also. Uh, then uh, this approach is uh, only working, of course, with starting data because uh, we, we only have phase difference and coherent waveforms uh, from starting data. But then we thought in the CCN of this project, CP4O project, uh, we thought about uh, uh, having a, a solution that could be used for any mission and any operational mode like SAR or LRM. Uh, this solution works uh, with the reference that we can select from the mean sea surface. For Christ, uh, there's only one uh, solution, but uh, in Sentinel 3 or 6, we have two. Uh, or the geoid. We started with the, the geoid, and, and then we realized that with mean sea surface, we had a better results. So we, we, have the, we get the mean sea surface, we fit it to the tracker range uh, over open ocean. And then we follow the, the structure of this uh, mean surface up to the coast in order to uh, get a reference in the waveform that is uh, uh, indicating uh, what we need, uh, what we are interested in, in the signal, the, the ocean and the air signal. So it, this reference uh, within the waveform, it guides the, the sub-waveform selection, of course, and, and also sits the retracker, the retracking operation. Uh, results. Uh, we have two uh, zones, Cuba and, and the Med. We have a lot of data here, six years of data, six full cycles uh, from Cryosat, cycles 7 to 12. And you can see how dense uh, we have uh, this mesh of tracks uh, around this uh, pretty huge area. Uh, we have Cuba around here. You have a uh, 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 steep terrain with, with high uh, mountains, some cliffs uh, in the southeast part of Cuba. We have the Bahamas also, a bit of Haiti here, Cayman Islands, and, and here lowlands in Bay of Peaks, uh, and uh, a lot of reefs and caves uh, all over the, the, the Cuban archipelago. So it's a very complex and interesting zone to, to study the, the coastal process. Uh, we will show this figure for both uh, zones. 
this figure is uh, the vertical axis uh, sea surface size differences. This is just sea surface size differences uh, or jumps of sea surface size be between one record and the consecutive one. Uh, and uh, averaging uh, versus distance to the coast. So we get all the information that we have uh, and, and, and put it versus distance to the coast and average all the information of these six years of data, and we can see how uh, it's very clear the improvement of sea surface site noise uh, when approaching to the coast. In blue is ESA, in red is the ESARSAT uh, coastal processor. Uh, if we zoom in uh, very close to the coast in the last five kilometers, uh, we see how the level of noise of sea surface site differences uh, um, that is uh, takes up five kilometers, we reach this kind of uh, level of noise at one kilometer from the coast. Um, we have this histogram also. Uh, ideally, uh, we, we should have here a kind of a delta with uh, very low uh, sea surface size differences. So uh, the worst case is the, the more uh, spread uh, histogram. And we see also here in this kind of figure uh, the improvement of uh, these sea surface size differences along track. Uh, second zone, uh, a really big one, is uh, Mediterranean Sea, but not only the Med, but uh, also a little bit of uh, Black Sea here and the coast of the west coast of France. Uh, and the Cantabrico, and also the British Islands. Uh, and the north of uh, the, this British, British Islands, we have a, a, a sea state uh, with rough sea, which uh, usually degrades the, the improvement of, uh, of the sea surface size differences that we, that there is, which is the parameter the, that we are dealing with. If we take the, the AGNC, I'm pretty sure that the, the improvement is uh, uh, way higher. So we have a lot of products here, uh, more than 11,000 products, uh, also six years of data and same cycles as uh, in, in the previous area in Cuba, 7 to 12. And the uh, same figure here uh, of sea surface size differences versus distance to the coast, we see also the improvement here. And if we get uh, very close to the coast, we see how uh, here uh, we have the sea surface size differences of ESA at two kilometers. We can get this uh, uh, level of noise uh, very, very close to the coast, like 100 meters or something like that. So we could retrieve uh, uh, very specific uh, features of the sea surface site very, very close to the, to the sea uh, compared to the, the official ESA products. Uh, again, the histogram, uh, we see again the, the improvement here uh, with the more spread uh, results with the ESA products. And conclusions, uh, as you have said, uh, we have an optimized solution uh, for retrieving sea surface site in coastal zones. We, we focused in sea surface site, we didn't uh, work with significant wave height or winds, uh, which is something that uh, we'll uh, be doing the next uh, months or years. Uh, the first approach of for setting data using the phase difference was adapted then for any operational mode using the window delay or tracker range. So it can be used for any altimetry emissions and which is something that we presented uh, a few weeks ago uh, in the Center on Six validation team meeting uh, with uh, very fresh Center on Six uh, data. Um, the approach is a sub waveform uh, retracting seeded by this reference from the mean sea surface in this second approach. We had uh, validated uh, this uh, in, in Cuba and the uh, MED. Uh, and uh, we have some results here in terms of uh, metrics also. Uh, in the Cuban area, we have the improvement of sea surface site noise in, in average in the last five kilometers of 63%. And in the Mediterranean Sea, and not only Med, but the British islands uh, and, and other zones in the north with rough sea states, which degradates the, this improvement, we have the improvement of sea surface size noise, uh, noise overall in the last five, last five kilometers of 45%.
in the future, we would like to to work uh, with the two approaches in synergy. Uh, also, we would like to, and we started with uh, Ferranti Web to adapt uh, this to work with fully uh, focused our data. And we would like to continue uh, to continue the validation exercise in other zones, like in Pacific or any other area, for example, in Svalbard with sea ice or or, or the White Sea uh, with sea ice conditions, in order to see how uh, the performance of this uh, retract with uh, price of data behaves. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Um... Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. We have plenty of time for questions. And uh, yes, I see there is a question in the in the chat um, from Paolo Cipollini, uh, who asks if this new approach is published. If this new approach is is published, do you have a paper on this? Uh, yes, this topic? is uh, this is published. The two approaches are published in the in the paper. And if I'm not wrong, in the final technical note uh, from the CCN uh, uh, of the CP for a project, there are also mentioning the the two approaches, the one of the window delay included. Yeah. And uh, uh, sorry, Pablo, just uh, um, another question: uh, Have you uh, compared the two approaches uh, with the same data just to uh, verify if there is uh, any improvement? Uh, had uh, given by the exploitation of the phase uh, in case of uh, sarin uh, obviously no no uh, with the phase difference information we we had on this this uh, we're going to do this this uh, extensive validation we just selected uh, the last one and uh, it, it would be good to to do it and to prepare the the processing to to do it also with the phase difference and perhaps uh, with this synergy, we could uh, make both uh, the, the one of uh, with the uh, synergy between the, the two approaches and, and make this uh, validation with the only using the first approach. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any other question in the chat. I just wonder if uh, you plan to extend this, uh, this work to other regions also? Yes, as I said, uh, it's, it could be interesting to to see if uh, in, in sea ice conditions it uh, it's, uh, it has uh, the same behavior. We we have done so with uh, Sentinel three data, and uh, the only zones that uh, really degrades the performance, as I said, uh, is uh, in rough sea states like uh, in Svalbard. Uh, also, it's sea ice, but also rough sea. Uh, Conditions and also in the north of uh, the British Islands, we we had this uh, uh, degradation of the performances. But for example, uh, we in Sentinel Three we did a study around Philippines, uh, and the improvement uh, goes up to more than eighty percent of uh, improvement of sea surface side noise. Okay, thanks. That's great. Um, so we can. Move on to the next uh, presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Pablo. Thank you. Um, so the next talk uh, is given by uh, Roberto Mulero from the University of Cadiz, and will be about the assessment of uh, cryosat 2 altimetry data using high-frequency radar for the study of surface coastal circulation. Um, so, uh, are you? Doing it finally, uh, Roberto, or is it a video? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, yeah. And can you do you see my screen? Can we see your screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, Hello to everybody. My name is Roberto Mulero Martinez, and currently I am a PhD student of the University of Cali, the University of Ferrara, in the program of marine of Earth and Marine Sciences. Uh, today, I'm going to present you a piece of my research, which is focused this part 
on the assessment of cryo-situ altimetry data using high-frequency radar for the study of surface coastal circulation. Uh, first of all, here I show you the topics that I will address during my presentation, studying with how high-frequency radars in coastal zones can enhance the possibility of validating and improving altimetry measurements in these areas, uh, following with the possibility of studying mesoscale surface circulation in coastal areas with uh, data from high resolution altimetry, in this case from CryoSat 2. And finally, um, I will discuss the role of the adiostrophic corrections for improving altimetry products in coastal areas. Uh, I would also like to highlight that the results and methodologies presented here have been already published in the paper that I show here, which is in remote sensing of environment. Uh, well, starting with the study area, the studies focus on the Gulf of Cadiz, particularly on the easternmost part of the Gulf. And the surface circulation of the Gulf of Cadiz presents a very complex dynamics regarding its temporal and spatial variability, mainly it's due to its location since the area is characterized by a processes like water masses change through the Strait of Gibraltar here, uh, also for the presence of eddies, ponds, and river dis discharges or counter currents. And uh, also it's connected to a large scale system, which is the Portugal Canary Current system. Um, well, besides, over the area, we have, well, there are two high frequency radar stations and multiples almost normal to the track, to the track, uh, I'm sorry, almost normal to the code cryo tracks. So this makes this, this makes this area a perfect scenario for the evaluation of altimetry data. Regarding the data used, along track sea level anomaly data from 14 different cryo tracks over the Gulf of Cadiz were used to calculate cross track sonal surface calling. Uh, since over the study area, cryo side are worked in SAR mode, we worked with 20 Hertz post bit data delivered by GPOT. The results, that's that result in around 330 meters along track spatial resolution measurement. Uh, you can see here in this table the corrections that were also applied to the original, original data. Uh, okay, the obtained sea level anomaly from GPOD was edited following some pre-existing methodologies which are summarized in the following scan. Uh, first, the values bigger than three times the standard deviation are removed using a 10 times loop. Uh, the resulting sea level anomaly is then filtered with a locally weight run line smoother or low filter. Uh, it's also important to point that for this step, the cutoff window or the filter is based on the scale of the surface variation and structures detected by the HF radar. So at this moment, this methodology is depth for editing the sea level anomalies dependent of the high frequency radar. And then when it, once it's filtered, we add the mean dynamic topography values which are related to the track position. So we can obtain the absolute dynamic topography. And finally, through the use of the geostrophic approximation, we obtain normal to each point of the track, absolute surface just of current velocities. Uh, with regard to the high frequency radar data, the stations that we use for this work were previously validated with ADCP data, in situ ADCP data. Uh, the main char characteristics of the high frequency radar data are the spatial resolution, of 1.5 kilometers approximately. Um, it has a coverage of up to 70 kilometers from the coast. And that's very important that unlike the surface geostrophic current that we can infer from altimetry, high frequency radar allow us to obtain the 
surface total velocity, not just the use job. Uh, well, the data from the high frequency radar will, were pre-processed in order to make it suitable for the comparison with the altimetry derived surface velocity. For the same, the data where the data that we use were the average of the 72 hours before the time of the corresponding satellite pass. And this part of the methodology is just for removing high frequency signals, which are mainly tidal oscillation. And finally, to ensure that the compromise is maintained between a good spatial coverage of the data and an adequate quality, only points with 60% of the of valid data or more were used for the comparison. Uh, well, as, press, as I previously mentioned, the high frequency radar offers surface total velocity. So, in order to reduce the differences between the total velocity from the high frequency radar and the geostrophic velocities from altimetry, uh, we develop and apply some adiostrophic corrections to the satellite altimetry derived velocities. First, uh, this one from here, a surface wind corrected velocity, which is based on the empirically demonstrated fact that the wind driving currents are directed almost in the direction of the wind, but with a small rotation to the right, around 10 to 15 degrees with amplitude to around 3%. Uh, we, from this assumption, we obtained the, this surface wind corrected velocity. And also we developed this bottom drag corrected surface velocity, which is based on the fact that the effect of the bottom friction is significant even on the middle shell and can even counterbalance the surface wind stress in shallow water. Uh, finally, the bottom a bottom friction and wind corrected surface velocity was calculated which gathered both previous corrections here i show you some result, results that we obtained from the comparison between the high frequency radar sonal velocities and the different different velocities from altimetry uh, here you can see a summary of some statistics uh, we can start here here with the performance of the absolute geostrophic current from altimeter with no adiostrophic correction against the high frequency radar sonal velocity we obtained a correlation of 0.61 and a normalized root mean square error of 1.19 uh, this these results are in line with previous studies but when we um, added the, the bottom friction and wind corrected surface velocity, we obtained those results, which show a high improvement, both in the correlation, bringing it up to 0 0.72 and decreasing the normalized root mean square here. The scatter plot that shows here graphically the assessment of the wind bottom drag corrected velocities, from altimetry against the sonal component obtained from the high frequency ray. Um, here you can see the average sonal velocity obtained from all the analyzed tracks against the, well, compared with the sonal component of the high frequency radar. For the coastal sector, the use of, of the wind correction produces a strong improvement of the results increasing the correlation and decreasing the root mean square error, as I previously said. Uh, also the effect of the bottom friction correction, which is the, the blue line, uh, improves the results compared with the uncorrected measurements, but just slightly. And the, the application of both corrections with the red line gives the best comparison against the high frequency radar. Finally, you can see here some examples of the of observability of fine scale surface circulation that the altimetry data allow. Uh, 
in the first picture, the surface circulation inferred from the high frequency radar, which is the black one, is highly variable in the coastal area, while farther south, the circulation is mainly southwestward. Uh, such a spatial variability is also captured by the corrected altimetry data, which is the red one. And the sp spatial pattern is um, almost in the same, is captured in the same way from the altimetry that from, from the high frequency radar with a slight overestimation. And the second one, an eastward current is, is observed along the whole transect with decreasing velocity from coast to offshore. Uh, also, the same way that before, the same pattern is captured by the cryos of two velocities measurements compared with the frequency radar with a very high level of agreement. Uh, well, some final remarks. Uh, how can high frequency radars be used to improve coastal altimetry? Well, high frequency radar may be a solid tool for altimetry, or well, mainly for the validation in coastal in coastal areas. In this way, high frequency radar could be used for the validation of future altimeter. Uh, regarding if it is possible to study mesoscale surface circulation is in coastal areas using high resolution altimetry data, in this case from Crayos of Duke. Well, I would say yes, as I showed, the altimeter showed a good capacity for detecting small scale gradients and structures over an area of high variability and complex dynamics. And the, regarding the role of so, the geostrophic components in their circulation over the coastal areas. Well, I think it's clear that we need full knowledge of the geostrophic and dynamical processes in the coastal areas. So in order to get a proper mm, use of the altimetry data. Uh, regarding some possibilities that this research open, well, I'll validate our validation method has shown that the synergy between high frequency radar and altimetry can help to unravel the effects of the angiostrophic processes in coastal areas. And that gives some possibilities like, uh, first we could develop, we should develop accurate local angiostrophic directions based on the differences between altimetry and high frequency radars a very important possibility that it opens. Uh, we could also validate present and future missions in the coastal areas, comparing it with the high frequency radar. And finally, we could make use of the whole data set of satellite altimetry data in order to obtain estimates of current velocities back in time if we apply the adjustrophic corrections. Uh, well, Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Roberto. Um, I'm looking for a question in the chat, but uh, anyway, I can. Uh, can you make making... my screen so we can see the? Yes, we can still see your screen. Uh, I can make you a, a question. Is about the so you're saying that you see uh, these uh, um, the combination of high frequency uh, radars and uh, as a to be uh, exploited as a, a validation calibration tool for uh, for altimeters. In uh, what kind of uh, quantities do you think that it, is, it will be possible to uh, calibrate and validate by comparison? Yeah, mainly by comparison, if we read surface velocity from the altimeters and we have a full knowledge of the adiostrophic um, effects and we solve these differences, we could use the high frequency radar as a, a tool for comparing with future, may, maybe also for future two dimensions altimetry. Okay. Thank you for your talk. 
and then uh, I think that we can uh, go to the next one, which will be given by uh, Walter Smith from uh, uh, from NOAA, which uh, has been has been contributing to the transmission mission from uh, the beginning as member of the quality working group, and that uh, will uh, give us a talk with title how crisis has changed it ultimately forever. Thank you, Michele. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Matilda, also, and Michele, for your uh, chairing this session. Um, may I uh, ask uh, Matteo Corona? Matteo, can you run the slides for me? Is that going to work uh, all right? Okay, thank you. Very good. So, if everyone can hear me and uh, see the slide, then I think we can uh, go to the next one. Um, it's interesting to remember that uh, Doppler beam sharpening in a nadir looking satellite radar altimeter uh, actually existed on the Magellan mission to Venus, which was launched in 1989 and arrived uh, in 1990 into orbit around Venus. And from that time on, uh, altimetrists, both sides of the Atlantic, were interested in having this kind of uh, capability in an Earth observing instrument. Um, there were parallel developments uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And uh, about a little more than 20 years ago, uh, I was fortunate enough to work with Keith Rainey and others uh, and proposed uh, such a mission to NASA. And at the same time, uh, Duncan Wingham and his team uh, proposed uh, Cryosat uh, to ESA as an ESA Explorer mission. And as you know, uh, ESA did select uh, Cryosat um, and NASA did not uh, select Abyss. So I've been delighted to follow the progress of uh, Cryosat ever since. I want to uh, congratulate Duncan and uh, ESA for making what I think is the right choice, of course. Uh, and uh, again, uh, uh, congratulate everyone for getting Cryosat 2, uh, the replacement after the loss of Cryosat 1. And so it was uh, when Cryosat 2 went into orbit in 2010 that we finally had an Earth looking uh, Doppler beam sharpening altimeter only 20 years after uh, Magellan began to orbit uh, Venus. Uh, so, um, if I may have the next slide, please. So, um, it was not long after that, some months after that, I, I think uh, I was talking with Tommaso uh, Paranello, and uh, I mentioned to him that the Bedouin have this uh, saying that you should not let the camel's nose enter the tent. And the reason for this is that if the camel's nose comes into the tent, then very soon you will find that the entire camel is inside the tent. And uh, I was referring to the problem of uh, allowing the oceanographers to uh, get interested in, in uh, cryosat, and I was counting myself among those problem camels, of course. Um, uh, the cryosat mission was very correctly and properly focused on uh, meeting its uh, primary requirements in measuring ice, but uh, some of us were very interested in showing what it could do over the ocean. And in particular, uh, NOAA needed real time measurement of wind speed and wave height for its high seas forecast responsibilities. Uh, so, this is a image here that's now 20 years old, um, but showing the wave heights, the numbers here look very large because they're actually in feet rather than in meters. But this is significant wave height in feet from Cryosat uh, displayed on the uh, screen of a uh, forecaster in NOAA's Ocean Prediction Center. Um, and so uh, we began working to make ocean products out of uh, Cryosat. Um, and uh, the Cryosat team very graciously allowed us to do that. And then very quickly, of course, uh, began to produce uh, their own products, which all of you are, are very uh, familiar with. We were also fortunate that uh, Volker Liebig and uh, Mary Kiza uh, had an exchange of letters that uh, 
facilitated our the cooperation of uh, uh, NOAA with uh, ESA and these these things. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, sorry, here, where am I? So um, one of the things that was exciting about the um, high pulse repetition frequency in cryosat SAR mode is that it was the first time we had an altimeter in orbit around the Earth, uh, which would give us the all the raw data that came down in the FBR product. Uh, and so we could test the theories of altimetry uh, that underlie the design of ocean altimeters since the uh, 1970s. Um, uh, everyone talks about the Brown model without realizing that Toby Berger's paper actually derived it before Gary Brown, and Toby Berger's paper also derived the Walsh decorrelation uh, before Ed Walsh's paper. Um, anyway, this uh, idea of how uh, the echoes from successive pulses are correlated is, of course, fundamental to making the Doppler uh, measurement uh, uh, and uh, was also fundamental in choosing a low pulse repetition frequency for a classical low resolution altimeter. And so we were able to test uh, these theories and uh, the theory uh, and experiment uh, worked out very well. Um, we uh, soon after this, of course, we got busy with Sentinel-3 and Sentinel-6. And so uh, we haven't uh, done uh, more of this kind of work, but uh, it's, we're coming back to it now in the context of uh, wave motion and what this does to the Doppler spectrum. I think the question of how optimally to combine coherent and incoherent processing is uh, still uh, a, an area of research, but uh, Cryosat opened the door for us to learn about these things. Next slide, please. And I really don't need to say anything about uh, the uh, marine gravity and geodesy applications of uh, Cryosat because uh, Ola has covered that uh, just beautifully uh, earlier this morning. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as you know, uh, Cryosat also enabled uh, the development of something that's been called the fully focused uh, SAR altimetry. Um, the uh, term uh, focus comes, the distinction between focused and unfocused comes from uh, Keith Rainey, who uh, points out that the delay Doppler altimeter was unfocused in that it resolves a distance along track that is much larger than the Fresnel uh, footprint scale. And that was uh, deliberate because of the expectation that the ocean would be a rough uh, surface, and so further uh, focusing might not uh, be worthwhile. Um, however, it is worth doing on coherent targets, such as calm uh, inland waters and leads and sea ice. Um, uh, Alejandro Ejido showed this in the first paper on uh, FFSAR, but uh, the illustration I've taken here is from a later paper by Marcel Klein-Herrenbrink and others. Um, I like this because it shows a couple of things. One is that you can see, you can distinguish a very small ditch only five meters wide and uh, from a canal uh, when the ditch and the canal are only uh, separated by 10 meters along track. The other thing you can see here is that there are false uh, images of the canal uh, in front and behind its true position along track. Uh, these come from uh, side lobes in the Doppler resolution that are due to the uh, uh, sampling pattern of the pulses in cryosat and uh, the Sentinel-3 altimeter has a similar uh, issue. Uh, next slide, please. One of the uh, things that seems uh, a bit of a mystery is uh, what it means to focus on a surface, which is in fact uh, moving during the time you're focusing on it, a uh, surface such as the ocean surface. It seems mysterious at first because uh, textbooks which explain how to do SAR uh, develop the explanation uh, by having us imagine that we are trying to take a point on the Earth's surface, which remains at the same location and does not move during the formation of the synthetic aperture and trying to focus on that point. And of course, that does not describe the ocean, and so it can't work that way in the ocean. Um, 
However, if we explain SAR to ourselves, not the way the textbooks do it, but the way Keith Rainey has always done it, then it's simply a mapping of uh, radar energies into Doppler frequencies. And uh, in that case, the longer time we use to make the aperture, the narrower our resolution of Doppler frequency. And so uh, Alejandro showed um, that uh, the Ocean waveforms are, are random speckle noise waveforms, but they are statistically independent in every resolved Doppler frequency. And so the more focusing we put in, uh, the more we increase the effective number of looks and the more we narrow the along track correlation in the speckle noise. And so uh, fully focused SAR has gains to make over unfocused or delayed Doppler SAR, even uh, in uh, focusing on a rough surface that is in motion, like the ocean surface. And this is another wonderful uh, discovery that uh, Cryosat data enabled. Uh, next slide, please. Now, I put this uh, slide in here for fun, uh, just really for Craig Donlan, because a few months ago, Craig asked me about the origin of these uh, chronogram diagrams we were seeing a lot in the development of uh, Sentinel-6, uh, diagrams with red bars showing when pulses are transmitted and green bars showing when they're received. Um, I started drawing those uh, many years ago, and the answer I gave Craig actually wasn't, didn't go back far enough in time. When I was preparing for this talk, I discovered that uh, I actually made the first of these kinds of diagrams and presented them in 2012 at the 6th Coastal Altimetry Workshop. What this is uh, reminding us of here is that the SAR mode that we have in Cryosat and in Sentinel-3 uh, transmits a sequence of pulses and then waits for those to travel to the Earth, come back, be received and processed, and then transmits another set. Uh, and because of this, it um, uh, is actively looking at the Earth only a small part of the available time. And it also gives us those side lobes in Doppler resolution that uh, caused the false images of the canals that you saw in a, a couple of slides before. So um, we were able to uh, uh, suggest some changes to the design of Sentinel-6 so that Sentinel-6 is now uh, pulsing uh, continuously, and we're really uh, excited about that. Um, uh, so, if I may have the next uh, slide, please. So, this talk is, uh, is very, very short. Uh, I simply wanted to uh, convey the thanks uh, myself personally, and I think I speak for everyone at NOAA, uh, to thank ESA and the Cryosat team for uh, selecting the Cryosat mission, uh, replacing it when the first one was lost, and uh, showing us all the things that an advanced uh, Doppler resolving altimeter can do. Um, uh, Cryosat truly did change altimetry forever. It was the first Doppler exploiting Nader altimeter in Earth orbit. And uh, although uh, the team did from the beginning and continues to do an excellent job of meeting their primary requirements as an ICE mission, they also have very graciously expanded uh, their uh, uh, capabilities and responsibilities into being an oceanography, geodesy, and inland water mission also. Um, by making the FBR data product uh, available uh, to everyone from the beginning, uh, this allowed all kinds of exploration and exploitation of interpulse uh, correlation, initially validating the Berger-Walsh theory, and then finally leading also to fully focused SAR. Um, and its great success in doing that over all water targets uh, then, of course, led the Sentinel-3 mission to adopt the cryostat style, uh, cryosat style, I'm sorry, it's very early in the morning in Maryland, the cryosat style SAR uh, uh, in an operational uh, mission, such as Sentinel-3, uh, uh, operationally for measuring uh, ocean heights and uh, doing inland water. And then, of course, uh, you, if you followed the development of Sentinel-6 from the beginning, you'll know that it was originally called Jason cs And in fact, the CS originally meant Cryosat. The idea was to take uh, everything that had been developed in Cryosat and apply that uh, to the, uh, the Jason series of measurements following on from the Topex-Poseidon mission, which some in the oceanographic community consider to be the 
uh, uh, essentially the reference mission for uh, sea level rise and so on. Um, later, uh, for political reasons, the CS was changed uh, to mean continuity of service, and then eventually Jason CS became uh, Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich, and it was launched uh, in November. Uh, so we're again uh, busy with uh, a new altimeter, and uh, we owe all of this to ESA and the Cryosat mission. So I just wanted to say uh, thank you. Uh, altimetry will never be the same, and that's a wonderful thing. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Walter, for this uh, very nice presentation and uh, also for your involvement in this uh, very exciting mission and uh, all these uh, puzzles we, we can obtain. And um, uh, we have a question from uh, Paolo Chipolini. Uh, what do you think uh, will be the main possible advances for oceanography that we will get from having simultaneous uh, star? Uh, both uh, KU, KU and KA from uh, Crystal? Wow. Uh, <laughs> Paolo, that's a brilliant question and uh, one I was not prepared for. And it's, in fact, uh, dangerous to speculate at this hour of the morning before the coffee is taking effect. So um, I guess I would say that we, we know to expect great things uh, in snow and ice, uh, certainly. From combining KU and KA um, in the ocean, uh, there are some interesting differences to be exploited. Um, of course, people mainly think about the uh, the rain and the the wet delays and detecting rain and so on. But I think that in this area that is still developing of looking at um, wave motion and how that affects things, there are probably a lot of things we will learn because the uh, uh, Doppler uh, issues are essentially all uh, three times uh, uh, different because the wa carrier wavelengths are about three times different. Um, and so we'll learn something uh, there. Um, the other thing that's interesting, and again, it comes from the shorter wavelength, is that if we have a sort of conventional kind of antenna, then a KU instrument is not beam limited by its antenna, but a KA instrument is beam limited by its antenna. And so uh, the ways that you get each kind of measurement to look at the uh, nadir point on the surface uh, are, are somewhat different in terms of the power gain. So I think there's a lot to be learned there, but I, I, I haven't uh, ever thought about it at this hour of the morning before. So thank you for an excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, so, unless there is any other question, Michele, do you have a, a question? <laughs> Not actually a question, but uh, I, I just wanted to to, to remark what uh, what I just stated that uh, about the importance of having uh, uh, FPR products available, and uh, this is uh, I think that. Uh, the having so uh, a, a wide product portfolio available from Crowdsat that ranges from FPR to uh, level 1B and uh, level 2 and maybe possibly in the future also level 1BS, it's a very uh, key uh, key point for uh, all the, um, not only science, but also from the technical uh, investigation that uh, and the technical research that was possible has been possible until now uh, exploit, exploiting cars data and this is very important also remember if uh, because if uh, uh, I remember well uh, at the beginning it was not forcing at all to uh, deliver to user uh, more than level two and so there is on one side the uh, great effort from by the by the by ISA by the agency for uh, distributing much more product than than those that were foreseen at the beginning, and on the other side, the uh, capability of all the uh, searchers of all the pe people that have been involved until now that uh, have taken great advantage of those data to uh, make all the science and all the technical investigation that we we have. Uh, uh, 
seen until now. Yeah, that's a very important point. So thank you very much again, Walter, and also for doing this talk very early in the morning on your side of the Atlantic question. It's my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> and so we can move on to the last uh, talk of this uh, of this uh, session, uh, which will be given by uh, Christopher uh, Burhaupt, uh, who is at uh, NOAA also, and uh, at the University of uh, Maryland. And uh, he will uh, talk about the potential of uh, uh, fully focused star uh, processes for oceanography. So we already had uh, an introduction by Walter, so now we're going to see more results about this. So Christopher, I leave you the floor. Okay, sure. Then, uh, then good morning from Maryland. Now the sun is uh, now the sun uh, started to rise, and it's quite uh, nice out there. Uh, so, first of all, uh, for the introduction of the, um, when we first submit, when we first submitted um, this abstract, it was over one year ago. That was when we decided, okay, we wanted to show some, uh, uh, some, uh, some results and some processing and some potentials of fully focused altimetry. But in this one year, a lot of, a lot, a lot of things happened. We made uh, some uh, discoveries, some new investigations, some work with other groups, and so now we came to a, a slightly different approach. Um, first of all, we start with the introduction, which will be a little bit theoretically, but it's only four slides, so please be patient. And uh, then, the, then the next uh, two and three, uh, the next two sections are actually um, about results, like comparisons with the ECMWF model or in situ validation. And then I start with the conclusion. Um, first of all. Um, what is uh, what is new about uh, SAR altimetry as in the old world with uh, conventional altimetry like chase uh, like the chasing missions? Um, what uh, what is measured? Uh, what's the principle sampled in a waveform is the range to a target, and with uh, for example unfocused SAR or even fully even fully focused SAR, what you now you're also sampling the return power of a scattering uh, with respect to range and its uh, relative velocity between the between your target. And your uh, and your platform in this case requires a two altimeter. Um, this makes it actually possibly uh, possible to uh, have better long track resolution because now because now you are having another dimension to sample, and if uh, your target is not and if your target is not not moving moving actually you can uh, you can sample a long track with an unfocused resolution of around three hundred meters. And a fully focused resolution of about half a meter. Um, unfortunately, or it depends on your point of view. I've maybe even for maybe even unfortunately, um, the uh, the uh, the SAR processing abroad uh, is pretty sensitive to uh, the movement of your targets. For example, let's get around the ocean surface, and uh, this actually degrades your uh, receive receivable or maybe even effective a long track uh, resolution because uh, in the open ocean you don't know from every far away scatterer its uh, velocity with respect to the satellites on principle what you're doing is uh, you're assuming okay <clears throat> it's a random process and uh, therefore you cannot uh, you cannot sample each scatterer perfectly or or accordingly which means uh, in principle you are having a <clears throat> Having a reduced uh, resolution or some so called uh, azimuth blurring, as it is known from the uh, SAR imaging community. Um, but on the bright side, um, this blurring is estimatable with a read tracker. And uh, the parameter which it can be retrieved is a sigma v, which in principle is standard deviation of uh, radical velocities. And uh, it can be computed. Uh, from, except for example, ECMWF by uh, using the zero upcrossing period, period uh, TO2, and uh, the significant wave height. And uh, the other nice uh, uh, property is uh, that uh, sigma v is actually the square root of the second order spectral moment. So uh, now, what I also started to uh, started to talk about is uh, about okay, uh, what's about uh, uh, what about the resolution? 
you will receive long drag. In this case, I, on the right, I sampled the Doppler frequency, but Doppler frequency is more or less a, a long drag resolution. So 200 hertz Doppler frequency is circa 200 meters long drag, uh, 200 meters a long drag distance. And uh, maybe not exactly, but more or less. <clears throat> um, for example, for unfocused which is not the upper part, uh, you're seeing uh, using the PDR, which gives you the 320 meters uh, resolution, something like that. And then if you are using a, a focus a focus uh, technique, for example, using a 160 beams or two seconds, which would correspond to the focus there, in blue would be uh, the resolution you would expect, which would be half a meter. But actually due to the blurring of um, the jeskettas are moving, uh, but uh, they have a principle of velocity and, and uh, acceleration. Actually, you're getting a, a much worse uh, effective uh, resolution. And therefore, the idea was okay. Then maybe we don't have maybe we don't have to. Uh, <clears throat> maybe it's better to not uh, focus over two seconds, but maybe a uh, half a second or maybe three point five milliseconds, which be unfocused. There would be a uh, would be uh, would be sufficient, and uh, the right is for very small uh, verticals, velocities, and deviations of five centimeters per second. But as I showed here uh, on the right, actually, it's uh, in most cases it's above 20, 30, 40 centimeters per second, and that's what we're showing here. So 40 centimeters per second in principle, there's no difference between fully focused uh, or focused star or unfocused star. Uh, the main reason behind this is that uh, uh, that uh, Chrysler 2 um, has a has a close burst transmission and receiving pattern, which leads to these uh, which leads to these uh, side, the significant side lobs, which are actually blurred too, and that leads that and that means uh, that actually the uh, long track resolution you receive over the open ocean with Chrysler 2 becomes very fast, uh, unfocused star-like, as with a resolution of 300 around 300 meter, which you effectively reach. Uh, however, uh, if you're of, if you're an open burst mode transmitting receiving pattern like Sentinel six, or in the future Crystal, you might actually uh, still receive a better resolution overall. Um, as we had this limit, as uh, this limitation was observed for Chrysler two in in the following, I'm just showing unfocused uh, <clears throat> processing results. And uh, what I will do, what I will show is a retracking results from our uh, orbital velocity retracker, SYNC SOV, which uh, in principle, which, uh, uh, which fits the, not the wave, not the waveform, but the stack. Also, in principle, uh, you have a, it's a two dimensional retracker instead of a one dimensional re, uh, retracker. And the reason behind is that because um, the, uh, the vertical velocities actually uh, have a very similar effect on the waveform than significant wave height, and therefore the retracker will is not able to distinguish between these two parameters. So therefore, in principle, it's guessing around between uh, vertical velocities and significant wave height. Uh, if you're looking on the stack on the on the bottom of the right figure, then you are actually see if you are, uh, zoom enough in, maybe. Uh, that actually is significant wave fight, which is here called represented by sigma s, is uh, mainly affecting the center of the stack, and the vertical velocities and deviations here called uh, sigma t, which is the azimuth blurring, which is two divided by the uh, wavelength times the elevation of uh, vertical velocities, is mainly effect is mainly affecting the outer Doppler beams, and that is actually something which the retracker is able to distinguish. So therefore, you uh, you can uh, estimate both. You can estimate both parameters at the, at, the same, at the same time by using the stack. So that's what we did in the uh, and, com and compared it with the ECMWF model. So uh, we are at the region of interest. We were using the ECM. Uh, we were using the uh, Northeast Atlantic Starbox from Chrys uh, from Chrysler two. Retracker is as I said, uh, think is OVZSK, which is a stack retracker, which estimates vector uh, coefficients of a side. SWH and sigma v, and uh, here uh, I will focus on the later two. Um, we were processing the stacks with 2.0 version 1.7, which is a principal uh, service on GPOT available, but not in version 1.7. At the moment, I think it's uh, 1.5. It's actually online. 
And uh, the retracting library was a uh, LSA Redlib, which in principle is the library which uh, we developed here at uh, LSA at NOAA to uh, make the retracking faster. Um, what I will show in the next is uh, the comparison with, with respect to ECMWF um, to, with two approach. It's version 6. Thanks, Lucia. Uh, first is state of the art approach. Which is shown on the right, which in principle is a, a unfocused cell processing scheme, which was shown by, uh, which was introduced by Keith Rennie back then. And on the right, the back projection uh, approach, which is used in, for example, by NOAA for process fully focused cell, which was uh, introduced by Alejandro Ichido and uh, Walter Smith in 2016. And for SWH, in principle, both have a very good agreement between ECMWF, so nothing much to uh, tell about this. Uh, but if you're looking at uh, the standard, uh, uh, standard deviation of vertical velocities, then actually uh, the results from a back reaction algorithms are way better. Not perfect still, because we have no significant offsets, a slope of 0 0.8. Correlation is very good. Standard deviation of difference with 10 centimeters per second is okay, I would say. So much better than a uh, state-of-the-art SAR processing approach. Uh, what we then did is uh, actually we found that uh, the this parameter, this standard deviation of vertical velocities, estimated by uh, uh, by a uh, by a star, star stack tracker, is actually attenuated by some uh, by uh, velocity slope correlations. And if we are correcting for this factor, actually we are getting a more or less perfect uh, consistency between ECMWF and our back reaction uh, Chrysler two sync SOV uh, result. And slope is almost this one, almost no offset. So the deviation became a little bit bigger, but that's because uh, we made a, so we enforced the values by multiplying with a value bigger than one in the end. So, but we saw, uh, but it looks like uh, at least with ECMWF, we can estimate correct uh, the deviation of magnetic velocities. And now, just to check if this is not just something between ECMWF and our results. And we also had a look on uh, buoy data in the uh, in the German byte, which was provided by uh, BS uh, by BSH. And what we are showing is uh, in principle uh, now two results: uh, one uh, in the German byte, which are two four, seven buoys, and three on the uh, byte three on the Baltic Sea. So we distinguish between both just to make sure that we have uh, that we have. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, that we don't have inconsistencies between region of interest. And here's uh, our data coverage and uh, on, of, of our buoy data. And uh, if there, if you can see a black dot there, then it means we found a Chrysler 2 co-location. And could co-location is reached uh, with the, uh, if a buoy point was available um, maximum 20, uh, 20 minutes away from the uh, co-located Chrysler 2 point and uh, Maximum 20 kilometer uh, away from the buoy. Uh, for SWH, again, good consistency in the German byte. So nothing much to tell about. And even after, and even also here, we had the alternation factors already corrected for us. And even for sigma v, also for the, which can be related to the second order spectrum, moment, we have an almost perfect uh, consistency. High correlation, slope of almost one, almost no offset. So deviation is uh, with nine centimeters per second. I would say it's okay, not perfect, but okay. But uh, nothing we can do about it at this moment. And for the Baltic Sea, SWH, fine again. And even uh, centimeter vertical velocities, not as good, but here we had 360 points because we had much more buoys, also seven compared to three. And here we have um, 128 points. And even there, we almost no offset slope with uh, 0 0.96 is good. Correlation coefficient is good. Then the deviation of difference is again around nine centimeters per second, which should be okay. Uh, to the conclusion, also what uh, we found out in this study is surprise needs as the back reaction algorithm leads to better estimates of sigma v. That was not planned. It was more or less a random. Uh, unfocused star has uh, seems to be sufficiently good. We estimate good uh, standard deviation of vertical velocities. 
And if you correct the attenuation factor, then we have good consistency with ECNWF and even buoy data. And overall, uh, we found that uh, stack read trackers work very well and seem to be the way to go in the altimetry. I want to be a little bit uh, careful about this statement, but uh, at least from what we saw and, uh, until now, it looks like that's the way to go. And uh, thanks to uh, thanks to uh, that, for example, Crystal has uh, two different allows two different wavelengths with KA and KU band, and actually uh, that they operate in open burst mode. Then uh, it might be possible to even receive better results with these two missions. But we have I haven't had time to work with Sentinel Six, and Crystal is still work in progress. So looking forward to the future. So thanks for the uh, attention. Thank you, Christopher. We have uh, a question from uh, the chat from uh, Tom Amorum. He's asking what is the impact of the vertical wave velocity acceleration on uh, the fully focused uh, uh, cell range? On the range? Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, almost none. Okay. Thank you. And I have uh, a question from my side. If you go back to slide seven, just for uh, my uh, to clarify my my understanding. Okay, uh, probably said the previous one. Uh, when you compare uh, standard processing with uh, uh, okay, is this one state of the art approach? Case one and back projection algorithm. Um, so, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. In the first case, you are making the Doppler, and in the second case, you are applying uh, back projection to one burst at a time, or uh, I am misunderstood. No, that's correct. We are in principle uh, processing uh, Doppler beams every 300 meters on unfocused uh, resolution, but with a back projection person, no, we have uh, these addition, we, have, uh, we apply uh, additional phase corrections. Okay, so basically, what is the difference between uh, case one and case two is that uh, you, uh, one of the main uh, difference is that you are compensating for the co so called range work uh, between both of them. Uh, I, th I think that's probably the main reason why we get different results between these two arguments it might be the range work. And we have this uh, range video phase and the range residual phase, which is additionally applied in. Uh, the back projection algorithm and then the, and then the summation compared to just doing an FFT. Yeah, yes, because with the back projection, you are compensating each pulse with a different range as it is uh, done in a different way when you compensate for the range work. So I think that this is uh, now this clarify my understanding on, on the reason why you have uh, the uh, improvement uh, by comparing the two approaches. Thank you for, for uh, your. Uh, your contribution is uh, very interesting. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, last point, there is uh, uh, regarding uh, to the bone chipot. Uh, Jerome Bevenisto is pointing to poster number 36 in uh, Brella. So I think that uh, we can, uh, if there are no more questions, I think that uh, we can uh, was the second session, and as first, I think that uh, we can uh, thank all the presenters for their very interesting uh, contributions, and uh, I I leave the floor to Mathilde for uh, close the session, and uh, we can uh, go to lunch at the end. Yeah, thank you, everyone, all the speakers, especially. Uh... Uh, Walter and Christopher from, from uh, the other side of the Atlantic Ocean for waking up so early. And uh, yes, it was very interesting. And uh, the, the second uh, part of this session uh, will uh, take place this uh, afternoon. And uh, thank you all for your attention. And uh, see you again at uh, two o'clock <laughs> after lunch. And thank you, Mikhail, for your for your support. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.